Thank you all for being here today and for learning and uh, hopefully participating as well uh, as we go through the uh, panels. Uh, well, I'll introduce the, the panelists and uh, have uh, some conversation up here, and then we'd like to open it up for questions as well. So if you, uh, as the conversation goes, I think you all got a card and when you came in. Or if you have a question, uh, just raise it or get attention. We'll have some people in the back that can bring it up if you'd like to have us ask it, or there are mics up here as well if you would like to come up and ask the uh, a question of any, any or all of the panelists as well. So with that, I'll get started and I want to introduce our, our first panel, our uh, economic impact panel uh, folks, uh, starting uh, closest to me and working to the far side of the table. Uh, first, we have uh, Jeremy Frecking, and Jeremy is the, uh, the Outreach and Operations Director for the South Dakota Department of Agriculture and, and uh, part of the uh, Ag Development Division. Um, as Outreach and Operations Director, Jeremy works with the public with commodity groups and with legislators to advance agriculture production and value-added egg processing within South Dakota. Thank you, Jeremy, for being with us. Uh, next to him is uh, Matt Dearson. Um, Matt is a, a SDSU professor and extension risk and business management specialist for the SDSU economics department. Um, he currently serves as the uh, resident risk and business management specialist for SDSU extension and it provides a weekly report providing growers with up-to-date crop prices and projections to help producers develop successful commodity marketing platforms. Thank you for being with us, Matt. Uh, next to him is uh, Dr. Bob Toller. Uh, Dr. Toller is a SDSU professor and SDSU extension swine specialist in the animal science department here at SDSU. Uh, Dr. Toller has served as an extension swine specialist for 30 years and is also a professor in the animal science uh, department teaching and also has research responsibilities. Um, he's a member of the National Pork Board uh, Swine Educators Executive Committee and is also on the board of directors for the South Dakota Pork Producers Council. Um, also of note, in 2018, he received a Fulbright scholarship to work at the Vietnam National University of Agriculture in Hanoi for five months. So congratulations on that and thank you for being with us. And uh, next to Dr. Toller is uh, Tracy Erickson. And uh, Tracy, I uh, grew up as, on a dairy farm as a dairy farmer and is now a crop farmer. And also in addition to that, uh, she uh, double majored in dairy production and manufacturing and has her master's degree in human resource management. Um, her career has been spent serving dairy producers and in the agricultural community through SDSU Extension. So welcome Tracy as well. So um, as you can see, we have uh, uh, some folks that have worked in a lot of uh, different areas and have some uh, great perspectives on the agricultural industry from an economic standpoint. Um, Jeremy, since you're sitting uh, closest to me, I'll, I'll just lead off with you and just ask uh, you, um, you know, why should South Dakota and southwestern Minnesota be open to pursuing livestock development? And uh, with it, you know, why should we be open to it? And what opportunities are you seeing in the area? Sure, thank you, Mike. How about now, can you hear me now? Okay. We're told to talk close into the mic, so rather uh, be bent over like it looks like I'm eating my cold cereal in the morning, I think I'll hold the mic. Uh, when thinking about livestock development and pursuing it in the Dakotas and in the extended region in Southwest Minnesota, uh, I can speak directly uh, from the perspective of South Dakota, what our agricultural landscape looks like uh, currently and where the opportunities may lie. Uh, you take a look at uh, the major crops in South Dakota, which are corn and soybeans. And too often uh, we think the customer for the corn and soybean farmer is the grain elevator. And that's simply not the case. Uh, we raise about 800 million bushels of corn in South Dakota. About half of that is, uh, goes into ethanol production. And about 80 to 100 million uh, goes into feeding livestock. And the remaining 310 million bushels leave the state, whether they're exported overseas or go to other states to feed their livestock. When you take a look at the soybean industry, we raise somewhere in the neighborhood of 250 million bushels of soybeans. And about 75% of that crop is exported overseas. And as we all know, or some of you may not know, that 98% of all soybean meal is done to do what? Feed livestock. And so I, I think when we take a look at the wide basis that we have in the Dakotas, uh, 
Couldn't we capture some opportunity in value-added egg production through livestock expansion, livestock development, and even some value-added egg processing in the state to take advantage of our large supply of corn and soybeans? Um, you know, we've seen areas in the state where they have successful livestock development and production, and they have a lot of uh, productive ancillary benefits to the economy. You have your electricians, your plumbers, your welders, your feed mills, and it helps boost the local economy. Um, it also, through livestock production, we can bring the younger generation back to the farm. Uh, with today's technology, uh, a young person can come back to the family farm, maybe put up a 2,400 head hog barn, and through that technology and management systems that they employ today, they can probably spend about two to four hours per day in that swine operation, and then spend the rest of their time helping out on the rest of the family farm. And so, uh, lastly, when looking at livestock development in the state of South Dakota, uh, you know, I spoke earlier about the uh, supply of corn and soybeans that we have to feed our livestock. Uh, did you know that, you know, raising beef, feeding beef, it takes uh, 90 bushels uh, per headspace per year to feed uh, that one uh, headspace. And so if you take those 90 bushels, multiply it by 100,000, there's another demand for 9 million bushels of corn. Uh, if you take it roughly times, if we, had it, if we doubled what we're currently feeding now, which the governor said is 430,000 beef cattle, if we doubled it, that'd be equivalent to another 40 million bushels of corn. And when you put it into perspective, that's uh, you know similar to the size of an ethanol plant. And so with that type of uh, supply and then utilizing the demand uh, here in the state for livestock production, we can really advance our local economies and put more kids in our local schools and, and uh, more, more money in Main Street, South Dakota. Well, thanks, Jeremy, and that's really the, the, the premise of what we're talking about is how to be sustainable going into the next generation, the generation after that, and you, you laid out some pretty good uh, path there. Uh, Matt, I know that uh, me personally, I've uh, uh, utilized a lot of the information that you, you post um, on, the, on the web uh, websites and a lot of your information, and uh, I'm so glad you're able to join us here today to share some of that. Um, as, as an ag producer myself and a lot of producers in the room, a lot of times we get so micro-focused on what we're doing and uh, I know that you, you can look at things from big picture and economic side of things. That's the side of things that uh, we, we hang out in our tractors and our combines and we forget to take time to think big picture a lot of times. So would you share a little bit of, you know, what are you seeing as far as big picture trends, um, you know, as it relates to livestock development in, uh, you know, western Minnesota, uh, eastern South Dakota, just in the general area? You know, what, are, what, uh, what things are you seeing and, and what, what things should producers be aware of um, concerning those trends that you're seeing? Yeah. Um Thank you. The credit to me, or shouldn't go to me, it should go to my students. Uh, I get to work with some wonderful students at SDSU, and a lot of that uh, structural work that's been done um, in the past has been done by graduate students in our department, so um, they, get, they get the credit. Um, trends. Um, an anecdote from my class. I teach an ag finance class in the fall semester, and I shock the uh, diversified crop and livestock farm with a with a financial crisis, uh, something mean economists do. So um, your operating loan gets limited and your interest rate goes up. And I've been doing this for several years, and um, uh, I've got a good mix of of crop and livestock um, students or students from crop and livestock farms. So a little bit of adverse selection, um, but during the peak of crop profitability. So say about four or five years ago, um, when I'd shocked the financial system, uh, the students would sell the cows and go straight grain farming. Um, that would get them through the crisis. Uh, this year, had the same shock and different group of students, of course, but uh, the students were like, well, we've got to do something. We've got to hang on to the cows because we need that diversification. So I think there's been a, a mindset shift over time. Um, SDSU still has, you know, an ag focus, um, so so that's not surprising. But being open to a livestock enterprise is perhaps a shift. Um, 
Another major trend, um, that, that corn growth is gonna continue. We're not using those bushels in the state. So if that continues, that will continue to be supply pressure. Um, a third one, uh, this is specific to hog finishing barns. Um, the profitability with those is not always there. It can be, it cycles. Um, when it's not, you know, why, why do they continue to build barns? You, you, you ask that question. And um, in, in Iowa, the answer this last summer was, well, it's all about the manure and the fertilizer and the value of that for the operation rather than just the, the strict, you know, dollars per head returns. So it, it's a complex set of trends, but, but those are some that, that come to mind. Thank you very much. And, uh, you know, the, as, as we look at, uh, at operations, and I mentioned before, you know, uh, most of us when we're in, in the egg industry, we kind of get uh, focused in uh, on specific uh, specifics of what we're doing or specifics in a community. And with livestock production, especially when it comes to communities and, and regions, we tend to think in terms of this facility or that facility. And we don't take the time to take kind of take a step back and look at the big picture, you know, what does further livestock mean? You know, and Jeremy uh, gave us some statistics early on, but uh, Dr. Toller, maybe uh, could you talk about, you know, when you're talking livestock, uh, uh, species specific or not, when we look at what is the impact of livestock production in a community? What is the impact to a community or to a, a micro community within the state or the region? You know, how, how does livestock development being incorporated into egg production, how does it really help a community? Okay. Well, thank you, Mike. And, and being an old extension person, I've got to have PowerPoints. And so what, one of the things I think is the obvious ones when you talk about bringing livestock in, you have to bring people in, right? And, and so if you look at that, I'm spe specifically going to talk about pig barns. So if you look at a sow barn, it takes roughly about 300 people, or excuse me, one person for 300 sows. So if you look at a 5,400 sow barn coming up, that's gonna take 13 to 15 full-time jobs in that community, as well as some uh, temporary jobs. If you look at a 2,400 head wean to finish barn, that's gonna take about two hours a day, and, and as you said, Mike, that gives them time to uh, work a little bit in that hog barn, but also in, in a other part of the, uh, of the operation. So these are direct jobs coming in that rural community. And again, as Governor Dugard said, 3M and Dactronics are not looking to move into Wagner, South Dakota, or any of our other small parts, but animal agriculture is. Uh, if you take a look at the, the next slide, when we talk about something else that, that comes in, there's, there's taxes. These barns are not uh, inexpensive. If you look at a 5,400 sow barn, that's gonna cost about 13 to $15 million uh, to build. A 2,400 head wean to finish barn is gonna be about 750,000. So again, at that township, at that county level, here's a new source of tax revenue coming in to help with some of that infrastructure issues that are out there. Uh, on, the, on the next point, when you take a look at that, we've heard the manure value. Matt talked about that. 2,400 head wean to finish barn. Uh, you get about $25,000 worth of crop nutrients out of that a year. And, and as you mentioned, I remember years ago when, uh, when hog prices were really low, at a South Dakota pork producers meeting, it was kind of gallows humor, but they said it looks like we're raising pigs for manure again this year, but uh, hopefully that gets better. And then the last point that's pretty obvious when it, when it comes to jobs in, in, in South Dakota is the packing industry. So Smithfield Foods employs 3,400 people uh, to process 18,000 pigs a day. If you look at the new Triumph Seaboard plant uh, right out in Sioux City, uh, just opened up last year, 22,000 pigs a day harvested, 2,400 new jobs. One of the main reasons that plant is in Sioux City is due to the growth of, of the swine industry in South Dakota. What I wanna talk about next is, is, is jobs that we typically don't associate with livestock and are probably just as important to those rural communities. And what I've done, I've, I've broken them out into three categories. We have manufacturing companies in South Dakota that build equipment uh, for, for swine barns. We've got construction companies and also we have feed suppliers. And so just to, to briefly go through those, if you take a look at that first line, MDS Manufacturing out of Parkton, South Dakota, owned by Brad Hone and, and his brothers. They make a lot of hog equipment. About 90% of the business is hog related. In Parkston, uh, a town of about 1,500 people, 
that's 65 jobs right there. You take a look at SDI Industries right outside of Alexandria, uh, South Dakota, another 73 jobs. Salem, South Dakota just got a new manufacturing plant. Hogslat out of North Carolina started a new shop there, 21 new employees. Those jobs would not be there if the swine industry was not growing in, in South Dakota. You look at the construction of, of those barns coming up, one, one of my favorites, Ethan Lumber out of Ethan, South Dakota. 321 people, 56 jobs directly building swine or livestock barns. And, and with that, and they're were, they were telling me another 27 plus jobs come along with concrete, with dirt work, with electricians, all those have to be part of it too. Uh, Summit Contracting out of Platt, a new company, just brought 16 jobs to that area. You look at Reeves Building out of Sioux Falls, 23 jobs, D&D and &D Marion, 10. And then you look at feed, and that's what we all talk about. You know, a finishing pig is going to take about nine bushels of corn, okay? So with the growth of the swine industry in, in that Parkston area, basically their feed mill has 11 people dedicated strictly to making swine feed. Uh, and the one I love, a few years ago they built a new multi-million dollar feed mill in Kaler, South Dakota, population 47. So uh, 19 people working in that feed mill, and there's plans for them to build another feed mill in Viberg, South Dakota. So again, jobs that are there because we're seeing the growth of, of the swine industry. Uh, Stan's Feed and Grain in Alpena, 17 jobs there on the feed side, and, and Central Farmers Co-op in Marion, uh, 9 to 10 jobs on the feed side. So again, when, it's easy to talk about the people working in the barns, but it's the people working at MDS Welding. It's people that are driving the trucks for Stan's Feed and Grain, all those are jobs that are critically important to rural communities and are there because of livestock. We've all talked about, about corn a little bit, and, and Matt, I'm not an economist, and I haven't stayed at the Holiday Inn Express, but what I am going to do is, is look at corn prices. And if, if you look at that top line uh, and, and the bottom line, it's corn prices every six months from January of 2014 through July of 2018. The top line is Sioux, uh, Sioux Center, Iowa. And the reason why that's there, Sioux County, Iowa is the number one livestock county in the U.S. Below that is the, uh, is the data from Parkston, South Dakota. And I want to thank Dr. Lisa Elliott from uh, SDSU Econ. She got me this information. And so if you look at that, on, in uh, January of 2014, there was a 40 cent a bushel difference between corn prices in Sioux Center, Iowa and Parkston, South Dakota, roughly less than 150 miles apart. Okay, and about that time, the swine industry started growing in southeast South Dakota, and what happens to those lines? That gap really narrows. So by the time we get to July of, of 2018, that basis has dropped to 12 cents a bushel. That means in a four-year span, the people in Parks and South Dakota area picked up 28 cents a bushel more than they would have without livestock production. Okay, so you think, yeah, 28 cents a bushel, that's, that's nice, but what does that really mean? Well, if you go to the next slide and take a look at that, and again, record corn crop this year, 200 bushels an acre, that 28 cents a bushel means those people that are selling corn are getting an extra $56 an acre due to increased corn value. Same amount of corn, but that value's gone up that much. If you throw in the yield bump with swine manure, that's another $3 at least. So. Uh, livestock is really important to our, to our grain industries too. So uh, one of my favorite quotes that I have uh, uh, above my desk comes from our former Secretary of Ag, uh, Bill Even, who's now at, at, at National Pork Board. People from uh, Lake Area Tech here, he's one of your alumni as well, and he's a good jackrabbit. But he said, if you want to have jobs, you've got to have chores. Because when you have livestock, somebody's got to be there 365 days out of the year taking care of them. So if you want jobs and communities, you've got to be open to having, having livestock. And then the last slide that, that I really love, it's, uh, it's Evan Schoenfelder. He's out of Dimmick, South Dakota. He's one of our uh, uh, past master pork producer winners, a Mitchell Tech graduate. And at age 21, he tried to, he's trying to work back into the farming operation with his dad and uncle wasn't room from the land side, so he put up two 2,400 head wean to finish barns. So at age 21, he went $1.5 million in debt, okay? But in seven years, he's gonna have that paid off. He's gonna have $1.5 million worth of equity uh, built up. So uh, when you want young people to come back to rural communities, you gotta have livestock to do that. Very good, a lot of good information there. 
Um, Tracy, one thing I wanted to uh, ask you about is uh, kind of in the bigger picture in the dairy industry where, uh, you know, we see a lot of things in the national news, the, the state of the national uh, dairy industry and, and uh, you know, the dairy industry is more regionalized and, and you see in the, a lot of times mentioned the I-29 corridor, both sides of the state line there where we're really growing and expanding. And, uh, you know, we have some unique things going on. In fact, I just read an article uh, this last week that was nationally published uh, talking specifically about what's going on in the I-29 corridor in the Dakotas and Minnesota uh, in regards to the dairy industry. But uh, what are you seeing as far as the profit potential in the dairy industry in this region? And, uh, you know, maybe if you have an example or two, uh, to, what would you share with us? Sure. And I'm, Elise has some slides she's going to share as I talk through this a little bit as far as economic profitability. I'm going to be realistic. You know, it's been a very difficult time for dairy producers and all of agriculture the last year here. Um, as we grow and look across the lines, um, I pulled some data from FinBin, which um, analyzes farm producers and their operations across the upper Midwest and pulling the Minnesota and South Dakota producer numbers and sharing that. You know, we take a look at the bottom line. The average cost of production in 2017 on a herd out there averaging 118 head, realizing we're a lot larger than that in South Dakota. But when you take that average herd, you know, they were looking at $17.33 a hundred weight to produce that milk. Going into 2018 and analyzing the data, as you flip to the next slide there, at least you take a look at the average cost of production, or excuse me, the average price received for all milk right now across South Dakota was $17.22 per hundredweight for the, from January through September. The one positive thing that I can say out of this, and this is, comes in reiteration as far as being a crop producer at home, you know, on the other side of it, and plus working for extension for multiple years, you know, there's give and take. And sometimes where there's opportunity, some other people, you know, as any business, you know, it, there's some loss. And so, to me, what this says is, you know, we've had low inputs. We've continued to have low inputs into the livestock industry. We need to take advantage of that. Um, soybean meal is down, so obviously our cost of production has decreased, okay? So as we look at that, um, that number and we, sh we look at that $17.22 a hundredweight, um, it's very important, you know, as producers and young people getting in the industry, the point that I want to make is you need to know that number. You need to understand what goes into making that number as you go forth and talk, and we'll talk more about this um, down the road here, but um, where that number comes from and, and what impacts it. You know, is there opportunity to go out there and take advantage of programs like the Dairy RP program, that's a risk protection program, the MPP program, to help ensure some of those things in your bottom line um, so that you can get through some of these difficult times as we continue to work and to grow this industry. That's extremely important. And the other thing I wanted to point out, you know, is as you get into it, um, the economic side of it, a lot of young people, you know, you're not going to just start out whole hog and get 100% of your income, sorry for the pun, <laughs> you know, from, from farms. You know, if you're married, you may have a spouse that's working off and helping to contribute to it, and that's why I threw up this median household income slide on here. Because in South Dakota right now, it's taking that a median average income is right at $56,000, okay? In the United States, the average is 60000 so last year's profitability for all those herds between South Dakota and Minnesota, you know, we were right at about that um, $76 return per cow. You're going to have to milk right around 786 cows using that figure, you know, just doing some simple math to make a family living 100% from that operation. So go into it realistic. There's opportunity, just like any business that you get into, to grow. It's going to take time and perseverance to get through these situations. Numbers. You're telling us we need to know our numbers. That's, we you need know, that's to know our numbers. That's what don't like to hear. But that's one message that we do need to hear, and that's why we have you here to talk through those and, and to remind uh, folks that, that we do need to know the numbers, especially uh, if we're looking to get in or expand or do things. It really takes some time, and we can talk about that more in the financial panel this afternoon as well. But, uh, you know, talking about growth, and Dr. Toller laid out, you know, some scenarios, some real scenarios of some real businesses in South Dakota and the jobs that they directly have employed and things. Uh, 
the governor talked uh, about some of the things he's seen during the eight years he was governor, some of the expansions in livestock in South Dakota. Uh, Jeremy, back to you. Just If we can continue this growth, what, is, what does economic growth look like in relation to the, to the livestock sector in agriculture? Well, I think when you, when you take a look at economic growth, Mike, it, it's more than just the capital expenditures of any new business project. Um, it's job creation, it's new housing, and it's also creating new businesses. We've had some really nice success stories in South Dakota. The governor mentioned earlier this morning about the AgroPure expansion for dairy processing up in Lake Norton. Uh, they're going to go from processing 3 million uh, pounds of milk per day to 9 million pounds of milk per day. And uh, that's, that's huge for the dairy industry. Uh, we've also added roughly 40,000 dairy cows according to studies at SDSU. Uh, Tracy, feel free to correct me if I'm wrong, but that, that cow will provide another $25,000 in annual economic benefit. And so that's roughly a billion dollars over the uh, past eight to 10 years. And uh, then it's not so much the uh, ag operations themselves, but you look at all the other uh, ancillary businesses that pop up. A, a fun story uh, I learned of not too long ago was a Mexican restaurant opening up in the small town of Centerville, South Dakota. The wife of a dairy farmer uh, down there saw uh, a need for some folks that really like Mexican food, and, and so now we have a, a new restaurant in the town of Centerville. Uh, although not in South Dakota, the Seaboard Triumph processing plant down in Sioux City has created new jobs and opportunities, uh, not only just in the pork industry, but for other ancillary businesses. As a result, what we've seen in South Dakota is some encouraging increases in swine numbers. In the past three years, South Dakota swine numbers have increased about 8 to 12 percent, compared to the national trend of about 3 to 4 percent. Also, uh, a really exciting uh, success in economic development in the ag industry is on the processing side of soybeans. Uh, up until uh, the announcement a year or so ago, uh, South Dakota had two soybean processing plants, one with a capacity of 28, billion, or 28 million bushels per year, and, and another smaller one in Miller, South Dakota, with a 4 million bushel capacity. Well, with construction going on with the new AGP soybean processing facility up in Aberdeen, uh, we're hearing uh, the capacity for processing could be upwards of 50 million bushels per year or more. And when you put it into perspective, that's, that's almost a fifth of our state's soybean crop. So you take a look at the Dakotas when they raise over 11 million bushels of soybeans, and until this new AGP processing plant opens up, there was only 32 million bushels uh, processing capacity for uh, an area that raises 11 and a half million bushels of soybeans. And so I, I think for us, it's taking a look at what is it that we do well in South Dakota? Yeah, we can raise some great crops and we can raise some great livestock, but how can we capture more of the value added economic benefit right here in the state? You know, China, well, we, we could talk about China all day long, and I know we're short on time, but, you know, they import a third of the U.S. soybean crop, but they don't take uh, soybean meal. They want the raw commodity of soybeans, and so uh, here we are re relying upon one country uh, to, to take care of a third of the soybean production in the United States, and then you have a trade war and tariff issues, and look what happens. Soybean prices are very uncertain, and as low as they've been since 2006. And so, much like a farmer needs to di diversify, I think the egg industry in South Dakota also needs to diversify. Yeah, it's great to, to ship raw uh, commodity products elsewhere, but let's do something with it here. It's kind of like saying, you know, ah, we, we're really good at manufacturing tires. Well, why export those tires and let them build cars elsewhere? Let's, let's, let's build those cars right here in South Dakota. And then um, uh, the governor actually stole my thunder a little bit. I was going to talk about aquaculture. Uh, I think a study showed in 2015 uh, fish farming uh, is now using the equivalent of uh, one and a half of Iowa's entire soybean crop. So how many of you had an aquarium growing up or even as an adult? A fish aquarium. Okay. 
Uh, I dabbled in it for a year and I didn't like cleaning the tank, so I quit. But uh, a lot of these fish, especially the bigger ones, what do they eat? They eat a fish pellet, right? And fish meal is very high in demand, low in supply. Uh, fish meal per ton, I think, is four times the cost of soybean meal. And so what we're seeing worldwide is 55% of all fish are now being uh, farmed in aquaculture operations because we've overfished our oceans. Think about that. 55% of the seafood you eat comes from a farm. So uh, because fish need that protein source and fish meal is expensive, low in supply, through research done right here at SDSU, they found a way to replace uh, some of that protein component in that fish pellet with soybean meal. And uh, they're doing some great things there at Prairie Aquatech, and that's exciting because uh, it's almost like inventing a new livestock species to feed soybean meal to. I mean, Dr. Toller, I mean, it's not like we can invent another swine industry, but with the aquaculture industry, that's more opportunity uh, to get the 250 million uh, plus bushels of soybeans that we raise here in the state. Uh, and enhance the demand for it. And so there's some exciting things going on uh, in aquaculture globally, but also right here in South Dakota. And uh, again, I think that uh, first expansion with Prairie Aquatech, that'll take them from 30 full-time employees. They're gonna add another 35 uh, with this expansion and hopefully great things are on the horizon for not only them, but for other value-added egg companies here in South Dakota. You know, the, the governor talked a little about when uh, he was growing up on, the, on a farm, on a dairy farm on, in the 50s and 60s about how they had very diversified and even uh, growing up in the 70s we had a much more livestock diversified farm than we currently do. We still have livestock but not as much but we've kind of seen those, those ebbs and, ebbs and flows and, and uh, when you interject a livestock uh, back into production agriculture you increase the amount of livestock in an area as, as some of your statistics, Dr. Toller. You see uh, uh, things which is called, you know, livestock can kind of be a game changer, and I think that's something that, uh, Matt, I thought I attributed that to you when I was uh, reading some of the articles you did, but now I know that I need to give thanks to your grad students. But, uh, um, you know, livestock can really be a game changer, and that's what we want to, that's kind of the discussion we're having. So what are you seeing in regards to that as far as, is, uh, is how does livestock be a game changer for a region, and, and uh, what are you seeing as far as, well, we talked, we brushed on some of the ancillary benefits and creation, job creation, um, direct things, but uh, I know you, you, you've analyzed this as far more in, in depth too, you know, so really how does livestock affect, affect a region and, and have you seen similar impacts in other areas that you can that kind of put it in perspective for us? Um, I, I like to simplify things maybe too much. Um, I guess ask my students if I do that. Um, I look at corn, I look at soybeans produced in South Dakota, they're big bulky items, they are easily shipped around the globe. Um, so I mean it's hard to fight that, um, but if you can take those commodities for example, and it could be other things too, I mean it doesn't have to be corn and soybeans, uh, South Dakota's really good at not being number one when it comes to different ag commodities. It's not number one in hogs, it's not number one in soybeans and things like that. So it's got some diversification. So, um, But back to the story. So you've got corn, you've got soybeans, big bulky stuff, hard to move around. Or it, It's expensive to ship those. If you can cut that off and feed that corn and soybean meal uh, to something else, and add value, I know it's an overused term, but if you can add value to that corn and soybean uh, meal here, and then ship that final product, that's the sweet spot. That, that's, that's where I really see the, and, and that's, you know, South Dakota's not gonna become a population center next week. You know, there, there's cities that are growing, but we're, we're, you know, this would be a horrible place to start a huge vegetable operation because, you know, Growing season's a little short, things of that nature. So you got to concentrate on the old, uh, um, concentrate on what you're good at. Now, what does impact look like? Um, you know, I made some notes for myself. I think if you could hit hub status, then you're really on to something. And that would be, we've heard, we've heard the anecdotes. There's Silicon Valley, uh, Western calves. You know, it's got a ring to it. I-29 corridor. Um, uh, the corn belt, if you can hit that hub status, then you get the synergies, then you get the, the overflow jobs, you get the critical mass. I, I think if I was the, 
it'd be, it's dangerous, it's, it's risky to be the first person in South Dakota to try to raise shrimp, you know? That, that's a high risk, maybe high payoff of venture, um, but, but it's a little higher stakes uh, game. Once you get 20 fish farms, for example, then you've got local expertise. We know how to deal with a, a pump that goes out in the middle of the night, we can deal with it at, at 20 below, and we can deal with it on a 100 degree day. Uh, so, so that would be the, the magic, is if you'd get to that, um, that hub status point with the economic development, because then you get all the synergies and the carryovers. My Very good. Sorry. Very good. And uh, just kind of continue on uh, that a little bit. Uh, what's your perspective, Dr. Toller, and kind of the multiplier effect of, uh, of livestock? And, you know, like, like Matt said, you know, all of a sudden you have uh, 20 fish farms. Now you can employ a full-time uh, pump repairman or something. But what, what uh, multipliers, in addition to what you uh, referred to earlier, do you see when it comes to livestock? Yep. So especially when you look at those jobs in those communities and there's a multiplier effect. And I don't know if it's, if it's fivefold mad or if it's sevenfold, but for every dollar that comes into a local community, you know, it, it turns over that many times. So if you, if you bring, you know, a thousand dollars in as cash, when it goes to the grocery store, when it goes to the rest or the cafe, when it goes to the, to the gas station, it's going to turn over five to seven times. So that means more money turning over there. The, the other thing that, that's huge that some of these jobs provide, which is really tough for farm families, is insurance benefits. I mean, health care, retirement, all those kinds of things. And, and oftentimes we'll see spouses working at some of these operations just to get health insurance and those kinds of things, which, which are really, really needed. Very good. Uh, Tracy, you know, as we look at the, at the dairy industry, and, you know, you, you, you gave us some numbers uh, earlier about, you know, the average uh, size of the farm, what, we're, what you're seeing here in, in South Dakota in this region, what we all are seeing and stuff. Uh, if someone is interested in, would like to get into dairy production, what are some of the best ways for them to engage in the industry uh, to get into dairy production? Well, I really think there's a lot of opportunities. And, and back in 2016, um, we commissioned a study in the state here. It was called the Blimling Study. And it identified three main areas to take a look at for growth. Um, one of them being on-farm processing. And we've seen that. You know, you take a look and you think about Stensland Family Farms just across the border in Larchwood, Iowa there. They're producing and marketing uh, their dairy products throughout uh, the upper Midwest here. And that's, that's a smaller robotic farm, about 150, probably going to grow in size here shortly due to demand for their products, okay? But there's also a population base for them to be able to access those markets. And then we think about expanding the global markets and the demand for our products and, and the existing plants that are starting to grow and the low inputs that we have here in South Dakota to help provide that growth. Um, I'm going to give you a little correction on a couple of the numbers there. As far as right now, we're at 121,000 dairy cows in the state of South Dakota estimated, and that we expect to continue to grow here shortly. When you think about, and if Elise has the next slide up, the number of plants, and you can see where they're located here, and, and thanks to uh, some sharing of information, I know Department of Ag put this together and, and had it out at World Dairy Expo, but that's a 75 mile radius around all those plants. So you can see where the hub is. Two of those plants, as we think about it, are growing tremendously right now. We've talked about the AgriPure plant up in Lake Norton, um, an additional um, 6 million pounds there, and then Valley Queen growing 25%, another about 1.5 million pounds on a daily processing capacity. That equates out to about 100,000 cows at a 75 pound herd average that we're going to need to be able to have milk access for here in the upper Midwest to supply the needs and the growth that these plants are anticipating. Now think about this. We've got a problem right now with exporting our grains. We can't get them moved to the coast. In fact, we've got elevators right now that are not accepting grain products because they're full and they can't move them. If we could only take those feedstuffs and put them into our livestock production systems, the impact that we would have and it would allow for more freedom of movement of those products and not have the glut in the market potentially and do that livestock development there. So, Elise, if you could slip to, down to the slide we talked about, and we're going to... I want you to take a look at this slide. Up in the upper left-hand corner, and I took this picture yesterday morning, it's Lake Norton, South Dakota. That's their main street. That main street was full. This is a small town. And the impact that this 
plant is having on there, there's houses being brought in. They can't have enough housing available right now due to the demand for employees whether it's in the dairy processing plant, um, people that are supplying ancillary services to them, um, feed dealers, veterinarians, herd managers. These are all people that are working in the dairy industry, okay? Um, outside of the plants, um, you know, dairy field representatives. I see Earl sitting down here, you know, and so, you know, it's growing. Up there in the top, this is a new convenience store that just got built this past summer. This is at the junction of Highway 81 and 28. They are anticipating coming out of Lake Norden an additional 100 trucks. They're right now, they run about 50 semis in and out of there a day. They anticipate that to go to 150 semis a day. That's not counting for the additional truck traffic that we're already seeing up and down, hauling feed and supplies up and down 81 to supply our dairies and our other livestock industries and our ethanol plants and our processing plants that are growing here in South Dakota. This is a good thing. It creates jobs, it creates opportunities, and it puts kids in schools and keeps communities growing. Very good, and that's, those are definitely things to think about, and I know as uh, one of you had mentioned earlier too, uh, or, or also as President Dunn as well, that the, the tax implications too, you know, gas taxes, local property taxes, all those things that to help uh, with the, uh, the uh, farm to, to a market uh, road system that we have too. A uh, statistic I heard later, and I maybe get this a little bit wrong, Tracy, but I heard, uh, you know, it, part of it is the demand for a product, but it's to us as human consumers too, and uh, uh, cheese, you know, we all love cheese, or most of us. Um, how much do Americans love cheese? Well, I heard, uh, 10 or 20 years ago, the average uh, American consumption of cheese is 27 pounds per year. Currently, it's 37 pounds. You think, boy, we're eating a lot more cheese. Well, there's more room to grow. The Europeans, their average cheese consumption is 47 pounds, I've heard. So, you know, a part of it is, as industries, is to looking at, uh, you know, what is the demand for your product uh, on that end as well, too, and how you can continue to, uh, to grow your industry as well. So. A lot, of, a lot of things we can look at and, and a lot of ways to continue to have that multiplier effect. So uh, we want to eventually get to, uh, to uh, questions here, uh, but uh, just real quickly, um, I have a question for you, Jeremy, uh, and then I have a, a question for the other three panelists. For the other three, just to think ahead, just to, for a real quick question would be, um, you know, what advice would you have if you had uh, just a... Uh, a few uh, seconds to, to give advice to some uh, young producers looking to get in the industry. But uh, first, Jeremy, uh, a little bit question, different question for you. A lot of roles you've had have been uh, looking big picture. Um, what does the next 10 years look like in this area in regards to our conversation this morning? Yes, and I know we're pressed for time. So uh, real quickly, I think we have some challenging times that we're experiencing right now. Uh, we had a nice boom in row crop prices from 2010 through 2015. And uh, now we're in a different territory. But uh, we also have some challenging times presently when it comes to the siting of livestock. And I understand that um, that's an issue where uh, local control has, has been the, the rule here in the state of South Dakota. But at the end of the day, we have 11 people per square mile in the state of South Dakota. We have a lot of wide open spaces. As I travel around the state, and then travel into uh, other states, such as Southwest Minnesota and Northwest Iowa, you're gonna see a very different landscape in rural America. And I ask myself this question, why can't we be doing more of this here? And so that's a question for us to, to really think about when it comes to uh, developing the livestock industry and the processing industry. Um, so yes, challenging times, but I also want to leave you with an optimistic message because I'm an optimist at heart. People need to eat, right? I mean, you look at the Pacific Rim countries and, and the economies such as China, Indonesia, Vietnam. Uh, if you ever travel to these countries, people have more disposable income. And what happens when people have more disposable income? Their meat consumption rises greatly. So there's more worldwide demand for animal protein now more than ever, and they need our corn and they need our soybeans. However, we also know we can strengthen our economies if we can raise more meat here and export meat instead of raw commodities. Uh, 
2006, real quickly, Mike, and then I'll, I'll, I'll stop talking, but 2006 was uh, a boom year, or the beginning of a boom year for the soybean industry. We had similar prices to today, actually a little lower, six, seven dollars. And then what happened? China decided, well, instead of 30 million metric tons, we'll take 60 or more million metric tons from the United States from now on. And through the period of 2010 through 2015, we, see, we saw soybean prices anywhere from $10 to as high as $17 in 2012. Uh, corn prices were similar during that time frame. There was demand for what South Dakota did well, and that was raising high quality and abundant crops. But also we understand that agriculture comes in cycles, and they're going to continue to need our grains to, to feed their livestock, to provide animal protein to their people. But something I heard from Dr. Uh, Widmar with uh, ageconomist.com this summer at a conference I attended, he said, cattle producers, pay attention. Could 2019 be what 2006 was for the soybean industry? They predict in 10 years, China will be the number one consumer of beef. And so we have some additional opportunities when it comes to our, our foreign customers to send, them, to send them some of the products that we raise here in the livestock industry, such as swine, beef, uh, poultry, and shoot, maybe someday some fish as well. So um, yes, challenging times in egg, but I think we have a lot of opportunities to look forward to in the future if we can come together as an industry and, and work together as citizens of South Dakota. Well, perfect. Well, current economics, big picture uh, opportunities in the future. What's a word or two of advice for, for young producers looking at getting in the industry today? It's not going to sound, I want to make this sound right. Um, don't discount education. Um, you can learn a lot at, at uh, the tech schools. You can learn a lot at SDSU. Um, don't, don't overlook the value of that. And, and a reason for that, or here's the this, this other side of it, keep an open mind. Um, the largest, well, this is a challenge for all sectors of, of agriculture. You've got huge economies of size. Larger farms in general have a cost advantage over smaller farms. That's a tough thing to you know, get along with, uh, but it's out there and the larger ag enterprises, the, the livestock development enterprises, large sow units and things like that, they're almost, in, they're, they're industrial scale. So um, have an open mind. That might be a way to get your foot in the door, so to speak, um, and, and get started in that industry. Uh, and sometimes it's going to take a little education, formal education, to get into those spots. So having an open mind about that as a way to, to do it would be my advice. Very good. Dr. Toller, same question. Sure. Uh, I'm going to approach it from a little different standpoint. So for the young people or anybody interested in, in getting involved in pork production, the technology, the business pork, of pork production is not going to be your limiting factor. It's being given the right to build a swine operation in, in your local community. And so without that step happening, you're not going to be given the opportunity. So what I'm going to encourage all young people to do, and all, everybody in this room, to become an ag advocate for agriculture. And, you know, I was in school a million years ago. We have a lot of students go through here, and their favorite class is speech, right? Get in front of a bunch of people and, and talking and, and sounding intelligent. Everybody loves to do that. So everybody's hate the job they hate to do, but that's what you're going to have to do. If you're going to be successful, if you're going to be given the ability to raise livestock, you are going to have to visit with your neighbor and explain to him, why, him or her, why this is a good thing. You're going to have to get science-based information, and that doesn't necessarily come off of Google and Wikipedia. You know, you're going to have to find the information that really means it and have that conversation. You're going to have to visit with your zoning board officers. You're going to have to visit with your county commissioners and explain to them, not just, not just because your family's been in this county for, fit, for, you know, for, for 100 years, but you in general, why this is a good thing, what you will bring to the county and make it science-based. And the tough thing is, not everybody's going to welcome you there. But having the, the maturity to be able to withstand that and, and be an advocate and, and convince them why it's good for you to be there. Very good advice as well. Tracy, what advice would you have? 
Well, Elise, if you could throw up uh, the slide with the, the glass on it of water. Um, I can't reiterate and agree more with what's been said already. It's extremely important to be involved in your communities, to be the leaders, to be in the know and communicating. But some of the things as I thought about this, this question were, you know, we really need to, whether it's young or old, the people that are in there day in and day out, you know, as with any business, you're gonna be successful if it's truly your passion. Find your passion in the industry. If this is what you wanna be involved in, you will be successful and go for it. With that, you're gonna to need to have, as I've already talked about, financial knowledge. Um, I wanna be blunt. If you can't balance a checkbook, learn how. There's plenty of opportunities. If you can't talk to your banker, go in and sit down and say, help me through this, okay? And it goes along with the next one. If you're not sure on some things, gather up that team of trusted advisors and people around you that you can communicate with and sit down and get some really good advice from and ask those hard, difficult questions. There's extension people, there's bankers, there's lenders, there's nutritionists, consultants, veterinarians, and the list goes on and on of people that you should have on your team on a daily basis that you continue to work with and talk through and to gain that knowledge from, okay? And then it's communication skills. Bob hit on this one, I can't reiterate more. Not only that, you know, communicating out in the public and to the consumers, but at home too. Human resource management is probably one of the biggest, scariest areas that our producers deal with on a daily basis. You know, it's an unknown to them. We naturally, in agriculture in the upper Midwest, have a deference to communicating. We're introverts a lot of times, and that's why we farm, because you know what, cows don't talk back, okay? But people have ideas and they have thoughts and they're really good ones and we just need to be able to converse and to listen and to gain them and help grow our business, okay? Technology, really important. Um, there's a lot of new technology out there that's coming and I think of one I just read about this week coming from CMIX that's out there and, and this company they're taking and not to endorse any company but I just thought it was really unique, unique as far as taking a look at the genetic inheritance as far as in livestock and in animals in particular in their ability to be healthy and not come and have infectious disease or mastitis and, and genetically just being more healthy and be able to identify that and take that data and apply it to an operation. You know what that results in? Less inputs as far as antibiotics and treatments, less sick and dead animals and a better bottom line. Now that's taking technology and putting it to work for you. And so, you know, there's many of them out there and I can go on and on, you know, AI is probably the biggest one that really helped us along the way as we started out. But use that technology, but then learn how to understand that data and what it's gonna do for you. Um, have an entrepreneurial spirit and it goes along with that willingness to change, you know, and be always open to that and get out there and listen and learn from all the people around us on a daily basis. And the last and probably the most important one is have that positive attitude. Yeah, we're in difficult right, times right now, but you know what? When things are low, they're only gonna go up and we can only continue to go forward. And I think that's really important as we continue to remind ourselves that you know what? Farming is a business, it's a family business. And I hope to see it continue to grow here in the upper Midwest and the United States. Very good. Well, I, I don't see anyone uh, uh, with a question right now, and I, I, um, we may be, uh, what might be best is to try and get back on track a little bit. Uh, these panelists will all be around for uh, over lunchtime. Uh, our networking time at the conclusion of our afternoon panels, we'll have a lot of time. Uh, maybe you can come and uh, visit with them. They'd all be happy to visit in, in any so, uh, sort of depth that you'd have as well. So uh, uh, I think just so we can get back on track, we're going to uh, do that. Um, so please uh, uh, be a free of, feel free to, to reach out to any of these at any time. Um, at, at that time, that'll work good. We will get uh, back on track. And, uh, you know, uh, communication was mentioned a lot, and uh, Tracy mentioned inter introverts. And, you know, in the upper Midwest, you know how to tell an introvert from an extrovert. An introvert, when you go up to talk to them, will look at their shoes. An extrovert will look at your shoes. So that's a good definition of a Midwestern introvert and extrovert. So with that, I'll turn this back over to Chris, and we'll switch panels. Uh, please uh, help me uh, thanking these panelists again for their time this morning.